Joining us is one of the nicest men I have ever known, a fellow who is so talented in his field that he is in baseball's Hall of Fame. He also does many things for his community. And I've got to say, it's a pleasure today to welcome my friend, Muy Amigo. Howdy, <laughs> Harry. Hi, Ross. It's so nice to hear you and to see you. And thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to see you. You know, we go back to many, many years ago when I met you. When I, just, I, I used to follow you when you were with Channel 4 KNBC in Los Angeles. Then you joined the Dodgers. Then I had the pleasure of spending more time with you. Great memories. Really great memories. I yeah, I agree with you. I mean, let's review your fascinating life from the start. Uh, you were born in Ecuador. In college there, you studied uh, philosophy, letters, journalism, and broadcasting. How old were you when you went on the radio for the first time? I was 15 years old, 1951, when I got uh, uh, my first job doing news and special events at HCJV, The Voice of the Andes. It's a very, very special, very unique radio station owned by, by the Protestant churches of the United States. And they are in Ecuador because of the geographic situation, so they can cover the whole world. You know, in, 19, in the 50s, when I was there, we were 80 radio announcers there. Uh, uh, announcers from Russia, from France, from Germany, 22 different languages. We used to broadcast. I was in the Latino division of the station, and uh, and uh, they are in Ecuador. Uh, so uh, let me tell you. Uh, here, you know, we say uh, KFI fifty thousand watts, a great signal, fifty thousand watts, clear channel. HCJB has a transmitter of seven hundred and fifty thousand watts. They they broadcast on that on that on that frequency in Russia and in uh, in Chinese. Uh, and they are in Ecuador to cover the whole world because Ecuador is in the middle of the world. So the contract with the government is that they have to uh, give sixty percent of their programming only classical music, semi-classical music, and Ecuadorian folkloric music no commercials at all, and news and events. Uh, I used to be, I end up uh, being the number one announcer at the radio station for you when I was 17 years old, because I had the, the morning show, the news from five o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock without stopping. News, news, mornings, no commercials at all. That was a great experience for me. And I brought that experience here to the United States when I came to this country in 1955. Now, is that the same station where you were the announcer for the uh, National Congress of Ecuador? Yes, for three years, I was the official announcer of the Senate of the National Congress of Ecuador on ACJB, but I was an employee of, of the Congress. What did you do with them? I used to open the sessions uh, and then I will go over the, the agenda of the, of the uh, things that were going to be discussed. Then I would introduce every senator, senator that was going to speak. And then of course I will get a recap of, of the, of the uh, laws that we were trying to, to approve. They must have really thought you were talented because you were still just young, weren't you? I was 17 years old. Uh, at the beginning, you know, the portraits at the doors that didn't allow me to get in. They thought that I was somebody that was that was wanting to be in there. But then I, I I had my ID and everything. They allowed me there, but I was I was 17 years old, very young, very young. When did you start thinking about coming to the United States? I would say probably the last two years before I came here because I had many friends that were Americans living in Quito uh, because the station used to broadcast in, in, in English and the radio station was uh, 
um, they had the best grammar school in Quito. Later on, they had the best uh, uh, secondary school in Quito. Also, they had the first uh, private hospital in Quito, the Hospital Vos Andes. So all the technicians were Americans. So we had about 3,000 Americans living uh, around the radio station. So I met many people there. Then I was the announcer of the number one program on Sunday nights at eight o'clock at night. I was the announcer of the program. It was with, with, uh, with live programming. So many people, probably between 40 and 50 people used to come to the auditorium to see the, the show and to hear the, the, the program. And among them was very, 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 um, uh, very often the American consul of uh, American consul in Quito was there. So I, I became a friend of his. And um, one day, half serious, half kidding, I told him, you know, I would like to go to the United States. He thought that I wanted to come as a tourist. He said, no problem. How long do you want the visa? Three months, six months, one year. I said, no, no, no. I want to go there as an immigrant. I want to take my family. I was recently married. Uh, so I need a visa for, my, for Blanca and later on for my son, Jorge. So uh, he said, come and see me in the office on Tuesday. So I went to see him. And in less than 24 hours, I had a visa for Blanca and myself to come to this country in June 1955. I arrived here into the United States on June 24, 1955, the same day that Sandy Cox pitched for the first time in the major leagues. Wow. You were 19 when you left Ecuador. Where did you go? Yeah. Miami? No, no, no. I came directly to Los Angeles. Thank I you. was thinking of going to New York because also I was, I was thinking of getting a commercial pilot license. I wanted to, I like to be a pilot. So I was going to go to a Tetelbury School of Aeronautics in New Jersey. So I was going to go and live in New York. But then I changed my mind. I started reading about the United States and I saw the demographics of Southern California. I saw that there were so many, so many uh, Latinos here in Southern California. I said to myself, that's the place I have to go. So that's why I decided to come to Los Angeles. I came uh, in a big ship and we, we, we reached a land in Tampa. And in Tampa, I took a Greyhound for five days to Los Angeles. Yeah. When you arrived in Los Angeles, what did you do at first? Well, I went out looking for a job. And uh, because I, the first thing I did in, in those days, it was only one Spanish speaking radio station, KWKW. So I went there right away to apply for a job. There was no openings. So I had to come back and start looking for a job. So I, I found a job in a factory on Alameda Street in East Los Angeles, uh, making uh, metal fences. And I worked there until I found a job at KWKW in December 1955. They gave me first a two hour show on a Saturday, uh, doing news, then it was a couple of hours on Sunday. Then in about uh, three weeks, they were able to give me a full-time position doing news at KWKW. That was December 1955. The station manager was William Beaton. Yes. He, um, he won the Spanish language radio rights to the Dodgers, and KWKW began carrying the team's games the first year they were here, 1958. I mean, had you ever seen a baseball game when you came to this country in 1955? Well, you know, I am very, very special case because uh, I am in the Hall of Fame. And uh, when I came to this country, I have never seen a baseball game in my life. I have never seen a bat or a baseball because in Quito, they don't play baseball at all. At all, at all. In Guayaquil, they played lots of baseball, but not in Quito. So when I came to this country, it's when I first uh, saw baseball. And it was October 1955. Uh, I had been here for three months, and uh, no, no, three years, three years, when 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, it was 1955, the summit that I arrived here. I saw people around radio receivers and TV receivers watching this game that was being played in New York. It was the World Series between the Yankees and the Dodgers. And I inquired around. I said, what's that? So many people in restaurants, in hotels, in, in businesses, everywhere. Everybody was watching this game on TV and listening on radio. So they told me that's the World Series in New York uh, between the Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers. So I became interested because I was very sports-minded. I started doing boxing from the Olympic Auditorium. So uh, I started going to the Wrigley Field uh, and to the Gilmore Field to watch the the Hollywood stars and the Angels, the Angels uh, playing Triple A baseball in Los Angeles. So I started grasping some of the baseball uh, on weekends. That was 1955, 56. Then, as you said, 1958, the Dodgers moved to the West Coast. One day, Mr. William Beaton called all the announcers to his office to give us a great news. He said, I'm going to give you a great news. I just signed a contract to broadcast the Dodgers games in Spanish. And he said, I need two announcers. Uh, and looking at me, he said, I want you to be one of the two announcers. And I said, Mr. Beaton, thank you. Thank you very much. But uh, now I know a little bit about baseball, but I don't think that I should be in front of a microphone uh, relating baseball to the audience uh, because I don't know much about baseball. But he liked me very much. He told me, Jaime, you will have a great, great future doing baseball. I'm going to give you one year. Please study the game. Prepare yourself. I want you there in one year. So 1959, 58, I was reading every book about baseball. I was listening radio every single game. You know, TV wasn't much of a help because there was no TV games, only only uh, the games that were televised on San Francisco when the Dodgers played in San Francisco and also the Saturday game of the week. That was, so television wasn't, wasn't helped much. So I was listening to radio everything then in 1959. Uh, I said, Mr. Beaton, I think I, I can start it. So that's why when I, I started. Rene Cardenas was the number one announcer. He was the first one to, to do the Dodgers here in Los Angeles. Now he lives in, in Houston. And I was the number two man. Uh, then Rene left in 19, uh, 1962 for Houston. And Jose Garcia, El Fat Garcia, came from Nicaragua to the Dodgers as the number one announcer. Uh, Rene recommended him. So I was still the number two until uh, uh, Jose Garcia passed away in December 1972, and I became uh, the number one in the booth in 1973. So you were a newsman that learned baseball. Yes. Uh, my main job at KWKW was news and special events. That's how I did very, very special things. I covered the funeral president Kennedy directly from Washington. I was at the, at, in New York at the, uh, when the first Pope came to the United States for the first time. Uh, I have covered conferences between presidents of the United States and Mexico, uh, Diaz Ordaz from Mexico with uh, Lyndon Johnson and later on the meetings between uh, uh, Nixon and, and and uh, Diaz Ordaz of Mexico. I covered two uh, meetings, one in, in Coronado, California, and the other one in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. So uh, at the beginning, uh, baseball was like a part-time to me. News and special events was my number one job. How long was it before you became the news director and the sports director at KWKW? Well, uh, I started there in 1955. By 1958, I was named the news and sports director of KWKW, 1958. The first six years, you didn't travel with the team to air the games. You would do what they called recreation. And for anybody who doesn't know what that was, uh, you would be in a studio at the radio station, uh, listen to Vince Scully and Jerry Doggett, on the Dodgers English speaking network and describe what was going on at the ballpark. Uh, you're bilingual. Was that still difficult for you at first? It was extremely difficult because my English was very limited, still is. But, uh, but uh, you know, the, 
only one game a week was televised. Mm. So we couldn't we couldn't watch TV and and do the game like uh, like they do now uh, in recreations. Before me, they used to recreate in English, but they used to be one inning or half an inning behind. They will take the game from the teletype or the of the ticker uh, system and they re recreate. But in our case, we were simultaneously on. We had a line between the ballpark and the radio station in Pasadena. Rene and myself, we used to go to the, to the studio there and we used to listen to Vin and listen to, to Jerry. And um, we were simultaneously on strike, strike, ball, ball, foul, foul. When it was a difficult play with men on base and let's say a double or a triple, we had to wait until the play was over to come on with the play. And, uh, and Vin especially was extremely, extremely helpful to me. He, he gave me information before the broadcast. He will tell me about the weather conditions. He will tell me about the traffic going to the ballpark. He will tell me about, the, about the, how many people they were expecting, uh, things like that. He was unbelievable, unbelievably helpful. Um, he knew that it was a very tough job that we were doing. And we did that for six or seven years, I think, recreating the games. But it was practically a translation of what Vin and Jerry would, would say. Here is what Vin Scully said about you. How Jaime did it to me is truly remarkable to be listening in one language and then speaking it in the other immediately while doing the play-by-play. -play. He has to be truly acknowledged as the fine broadcaster that he is. Nice compliment. Coming from Vin, those words mean a lot to me. He has been a great, uh, great teacher to me. He has been my teacher. He has been my, my friend. He has been my idol. Uh, I don't have idols in the baseball world except Vin. Uh, Vin has been everything to me. He got the patience to be with me, and uh, uh, he gave me the most precious times when we were traveling and we had a night off. He, the traveling secretary, and myself were dining, dining together all the time. He was very special. He still is. I'm sure Vin told you what he told me during my 28 years with him as uh, one of the Dodger broadcasters. He said, Prepare rigorously for every game. Don't get too close to the Dodger players and stay out of the front office so you don't get caught in politics. Well, he told me exactly the same thing. <laughs> he told me, I, may, I am not going to be to give you any, any advice because I don't feel uh, doing that. But let me tell you two things. Seekers, always be prepared. Always. Doesn't matter if you have done 1,000 games, 10,000 games, if every game is different. So be prepared. Read a lot. Not only about baseball, about everything, because you will have the opportunity to relate something uh, with, with baseball, and that will enrich uh, your, 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 your broadcast. He told me, be prepared. Be prepared. Always read a lot and, uh, and uh, don't get too close to the baseball players. Be nice with them. But uh, because if you become too close, then that will affect your, your way of broadcasting. Uh, so he told you that and he told me the same thing. The Dodgers finished seventh in what was in the 18 National League, their first year in 1958. But the next year, as you said earlier, well, that was uh, some a, a great year. They went to the World Series. You were only 23 years old. How about that? And the, the, that was my, my first year in baseball, 1959, because as I told you, uh, I just moved in in the 58, and I couldn't do the, the games in 58. So 59 was my first year, and the first uh, World Series that the Dodgers won in Los Angeles. The second because they won one in, in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, so it is something so unique, so special, and I cherish that, that uh, experience so, so, so well. For the home games against the White Sox, 
you work from a booth at the Coliseum. When the team played in Chicago, you broadcast in front of a television set in a studio here in Los Angeles. The Dodgers won the 1959 series, and you'll remember this, Jaime. The Dodgers lost the first game of that series to the White Sox 11 to nothing. To nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I remember very well. I remember as you. you. Was it tough to work in front of a television set? It was tough. It was tough to work, but we were excited. You know, it was a World Series, my first World Series, and the same thing for Rene Cardenas, the same, the first one. So it was very, very unique, very special. And uh, when they won, finally, uh, we were so excited. We were so excited. Uh, we participated later on and, and on all the festivities that the Dodgers had after winning the World Series. It was a remarkable year, 1959. From 1962, the first year the Dodgers were at Dodger Stadium, till 1984, you never missed a game. You called nearly 4,000 games. <laughs> Did you ever come close to missing a game? No, no. God has been so, so nice with me, gave me a great, great physical condition. My throat never bothers me. So uh, probably I had a couple of instances when I had a little cold, but uh, not that bad to, to miss a game. So, uh, and I, I stopped the streak because of the Olympics, I think 84 Olympics. Uh, Peter O'Malley asked me to leave the dashes because Peter was working very hard. He was working very hard in order to get the baseball as a medal sport in the Olympics. So he asked me to leave the Dodgers for three weeks and work for the Olympic Committee. So I was the, in, in charge of the, uh, all the radio production of the Olympics in 1984. And, and I stopped my 4,000 games. Uh, I think it's 4,013 games. Street, uh, Brain Shire is the one that, that, uh, that uh, investigated that and, and, and was able to establish that, that number because I never pay attention to that. So, but it was something very, very special to me. The 1980 and 1981 seasons were very special for you. Fernando Valenzuela became an overnight hero, and you served as the interpreter. Tell us about those experiences. Yes, uh, when Fernando joined the Dodgers, we were in uh, Houston. Uh, he came from San Antonio, where he had really a streak of great and good number of innings without allowing any runs. So he joined the Dodgers in, in, in Houston in September. Uh, we were on the road. He, he didn't pitch in, in, in Houston. Then we moved to Cincinnati. He didn't pitch in Cincinnati. Then we went to Atlanta, and he came into a game. And the first battle that he faced was... Uh, uh, Bruce Benedict, the catcher from the Atlanta Braves, and he hit a fly ball to center field. That was the, the start of, of Fernando Mania. To me, Fernando Mania started not, not I think, in 81, but in 1980, when uh, Fernando came to pitch as a reliever in that last series of the, of the season against the Houston Astros. The Dodgers had to win three games in order to finish first, in first place uh, uh, tied with the, with the Astros. So, um, and he won the first game. He, uh, Jerry Royce won the second game, and Rene, I mean uh, Fernando came in the sixth inning to relieve in the third inning, and um, and uh, uh, Steve Howe uh, came in the ninth inning, no, in the tenth inning because he went ten innings, and the Dodgers won. So they they need an, an extra game. Many people thought that La Soda should use Fernando as a starter, but I don't think so. I think it was asking too much to to ask this young kid. First year in the major leagues, a rookie, uh, very green, to start such an important game. So uh, they got started the game, but by the third inning, the Astros were winning seven to to one. Um, uh, Burr Hutton allowed; uh, he was a starting pitcher, allowed four runs. Then um, Sad Cliff came and relieved in the third inning, and he allowed uh, three runs. So. Uh, it was seven to one ahead for of uh, Houston, 
when Fernando came and tried to pitch into the game in the in the in the seventh inning. But that's when people realized how special Fernando was. Then we have 1981 season. Fernando got the assignment to start the game, and he won the first eight games, five of them uh, as a shutout. Uh, when Fernando came to the Dodgers in 1981, as I as started, uh, they need uh, somebody to translate for him. At the beginning, they, they asked Manny Mota, who was a first base coach, to help translating for Fernando. And also Pepe Frias, who was the second baseman, who became very close friend of Fernando, probably the closest friend that Fernando had the first two years in the Dodgers organization. So, but then Fred Clare, who was the head of publicity, he thought that it was not not really good to, to use players or coaches helping Fernando. So he came to me and said, Jaime, as you work for the Dodgers. You are with the Dodgers everywhere. You travel with the team. Could you help Fernando translate it for him? And I said, fine, that will be fine. So that's how he started to helping Fernando. Did Fernando know more English than he let on? Later on, yeah. Now he speaks very, very good English. But the, but the first two years, really, he couldn't speak any word. He couldn't understand any, any, any English at all. He needed help. He needed help. No question about it. But he was always on top of everything. Even though he didn't uh, understand English, he didn't speak English, he knew exactly what was going on around him. And we went to, to cities where... We had press conferences that were very difficult for Fernando, New York especially, where, the, where when, we were, when we went to New York for the first time, there were about 100 newspaper men waiting for us uh, at the airport and going to the Shea Stadium. And, uh, and, and, uh, but, but Fernando was very sharp, very intelligent. The only advice that I gave to him said, Fernando, you don't have to answer every question that they ask you. If you don't like any question for any reason, just be polite and say, I'm sorry. I don't care answering that question. Next one, please. That's the only advice that I gave him. And he did very, very well. He never refused a question. He, he never lost his uh, composure. Uh, he, he was really, really fantastic. Fantastic. Well, in 1981, that first full season for him, he had eight shutouts. That's remarkable. Yes. Well, uh, at the beginning, he got five shutouts at the beginning of the season. Eight wins, five shutouts at the beginning of the season. Wow. I mean, you have to be proud of the growth of Hispanic Dodger fans and the role that you have played in helping that. Tell us what percent of the Dodger fan base was Latino when you started in 1959, and what is it today? Well, I understand that when we used to do the games at the Coliseum, the Latinos attending the Coliseum was about 8 to 10% at the most. Days in Dodger Stadium, they say it's about 42 to 46%. That means that we have really cultivated the Latino market in Southern California. Three reasons why I have lasted this long doing baseball long. Uh, my longevity is because first, I love what I do. I am in love with baseball. Nothing better for me to, to be doing baseball. I love the game. Number two, the support that I got from my family particularly from Blanca. She never complained about my, my absenteeism. She never complained about me being away from home so much. And my kids, you know, Jorge, Mauricio, and Jimmy, they were growing up, and many times I wasn't with them. So Blanca is the one that took them to a, to a park, to, a, to a horse riding, and things like that. It was Blanca. And, and, and she never, never complained about my job. She was very proud of what I was uh, 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 getting. And, and she was always one step or half step behind me. She didn't want to, to, to object, I mean, to, I don't know quite how to put it, this is, but she was always behind me, helping me a lot, and that's the second reason. And the third reason is that I was very fortunate 
to find an organization, in this case, the values that really respect the community, the Latino community. They really appreciate the, what the, the Latinos mean to baseball. There is no question that the segment of population in the entire country that really follows uh, uh, baseball is the Latinos. The Latinos of baseball, they are very sports-minded people. They love boxing, they love soccer, and they love baseball. But I think we, we were able to cultivate, because, you know, at the beginning, Ross, we had to teach the game. I remember many times they would ask me, Jaime, what do you mean by he was out from six to three? And I had to look. Every position has a number. The pitcher's number one, the catcher number three, number two, the, the first man number three. So if the ball goes to, to the shortstop, who is number six, and he picks up the ball and throws to first, he throws to the number three. So it's six to three. If there's a fly ball to center field, number eight, that's a fly ball to center field, is fly to number eight. So we had to teach people, uh, especially when Fernando arrived to the scene, Many women, especially ladies, they were behind Fernando. They used to they used to pray the rosary the days that Fernando was preaching. It was unbelievable. In those days, there was no uh, no social media, so everything was through the phone or through letters. I used to get so many letters, so many phone calls from people that were following Fernando, and that was unbelievable. And especially, you know, people from Mexico, from Central America and South America, who didn't care much about baseball, they became, thanks to Fernando and thanks to our broadcasts, the followers of baseball. So I think Fernando is the single one ball player that created more new baseball fans than any other player in the history of the game. Because here, you know, regarding Koufax or Drysdale or Maury Wills, people here, the kids at school, they already start knowing baseball. When they are four years old, five, six, seven years old, they know baseball. But in our case, kids coming from Central America, from South America, from Mexico, they didn't know at all baseball. So we had to teach them and to, to be able to say that uh, the percentage that, uh, that have been increased, it's, it's amazing. And I think it is because the Dodgers had the... Had the, the the, the vision to say how big the Latino community is in Southern California. Angels broadcaster Jose Mota has said, Jaime is a jewel for baseball globally. He's always had a sense for community engagement, learning, and teaching through his broadcast. Baseball as a whole is better because of him. Nice words. Those uh, words overmoved me that uh, really I appreciate very much. Well, I have been always very interested in the well-being of the community. Uh, so at the beginning, I used to help the community doing special events, doing news, because in those days, practically radio was the only way how many millions of Latinos were able to get news and be aware of what's, what was going on around, around the community. So radio was the number one tool for reaching the, the, the people. So I, was, I had a facility. So I always, uh, sometimes I had a little problem with Blanca because I used to say, uh, well, Jaime, it was Sunday, I used to be at home, but there is a march going on in East Los Angeles uh, because of the racial situation. I have to go and cover that thing and things like that, you know. Uh, I, I was very much aware of the needs of the community and I, I had a tool at my hands to do something and I did uh, very, very happily. But baseball was not the only sport in which you were an expert. You called over 30 world championship boxing bouts around the world <laughs> for radio and television stations in Latin America. What was your favorite fight? Well, no question about it. You know, I was in Manila for the Manila Thriller, uh, Cassius Clay and, and Fraser. 
that was that was uh, 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 you know to t- to say that both fighters went to the hospital after the fight uh, it tells you how important the fight was. It was an unbelievable fight. The conditions were so bad. It was so hot. It was raining. The fight was at ten o'clock in the morning. So oh, so many things you know before the fight. Uh, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay used to go. Uh, running the streets around the, the arena, uh, talking about the fight, and uh, uh, it was a unique fight. Uh, yes, I was very fortunate to do many, many championship fights. I did all the uh, all the championship fights of, of Mexican fighters here in Southern California, the days of Pajarito Moreno, the days of, uh, of uh, uh, Pimentel, uh, oh, so many of those, all those. But uh, I did a uh, fight from Paris, between Antequianapolis and uh, Carlos Monzon from Argentina, uh, from Paris. Then I did fights from uh, Monte Carlo, from Rome, from Milano, uh, Monzon and, and Benvenuti. And I did a fight from, uh, from Japan, uh, Mexican fighter Saldivar was uh, defending his title there. So I have done my num- good number of fights. I did many fights from San Juan, Puerto Rico, from, from Las Vegas, from Houston championship fights. So I enjoy doing fights, totally different than doing baseball, because in doing fights, it was going to the city the day of the fight, do the fight and come back the next day. No time for going around and no time for commentary. It was just a description of blah, 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 the fights. So it's different. And baseball, you have to fill the time, you know, because lots of time you have to fill. So I enjoy doing both, both things. I stopped doing boxing about uh, 15 years ago. I think it was too much for me to be doing baseball and fights. But your favorite was the Thrilla in Manila, as they called it. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Jaime, you have been honored so many times, I cannot mention them all. But here are a few. The highest civilian medal from your native Ecuador. Your induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1998 a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You have announced 25 World Series, six of them won by the Dodgers, 19 All-Star Games for various networks. Now, in your eighth decade as a Major League announcer, about to start your 63rd season with the Dodgers, making you the longest tenured active baseball broadcaster in the major leagues. Quite a career, my friend. Yes, it has been a great ride for a young kid who was uh, 19 years old, who came from a, from a very small country in South America without knowing much of English, without knowing nothing about baseball. Yes, I have been, I have been uh, blessed. I have to add to what you said, you know, now I am in, I think about, about six Hall of Famers now. Uh, uh, I have in uh, Cooperstown, then there's the Latino Hall of Fame, there is the, the Caribbean Series Hall of Fame, there is the Latino Museum Hall of Fame in San Francisco, six museums in total. In total. Some of my, my uh, remembrances have been in Washington at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. So God has been so generous with me and the community, the community has been so wonderful with me because, you know, doing radio and doing TV, if you don't have the numbers, you are not going to last uh, the time that I have lasted. Uh, so it's amazing that right now I am the senior of all, all announcers, radio, TV, in any language in the Major League Baseball. And um, the second uh, behind Vin with the Dodgers. And uh, it's, it's really, really unbelievable. I stop, I think, and it's hard to believe, but it's uh, true. And, and I have enjoyed very, very much, you know. Uh, I have been blessed having the best seat in, in, the, in, this, in the house, in Dodgers Stadium, and uh, serving millions of people. Uh, I have done now uh, 29 World Series counting the last three with the Dodgers. And I have done, I don't know exactly how many no-hitters, probably 20, 
23 or 24, something like that. So uh, really, it's, it has been amazing. It has been amazing. And uh, I am humbly very excited to recognize those numbers. Jaime, do you think there's any announcer in the world who is still on the air as long as you've been on? The only thing I can tell you is that uh, the announcers that they started with me are gone. No, no, not a single one alive in Ecuador. Here in Los Angeles, uh, in Spanish radio at least, there is no one on from the 50s when I started here in 1955. So for me, it's very tough. Probably in some other countries, in Europe, in the Far East, somewhere could be someone active uh, as long as I am. You've been on 70 years. 70, yes. Seven, oh, 70. Since 1951. Jaime, I would like your son, Jorge, who is retiring after six years working with you on the broadcast and the radio booth to kind of join us now because he's one of our favorites. Yes, Ross, you know, it has been my great, great blessing to be working with Jorge. He has been behind me uh, all the time and now he is taking care of me. He, he, he wants to be sure that I am not going out on this epidemic now. So he, he, he has been amazing. Like my other son, Mauricio, I have been blessed with two great, great sons. All right. Jorge, nice to see you. Jorge is just a terrific man who uh, has had a great career. And now uh, he is retired to be spending more time with his family. I know that one thing that is very dear to both of your hearts is the Jaime and Blanca Harin Foundation. Jaime, you start by telling us about the foundation. When Blanca passed away two years ago, uh, days after it was Jorge who came to me and said that we have to follow the wishes of Blanca. Blanca was a very, very generous person. And especially in the last, uh, I would say three or four years, she became very, very aware of the needs on, on, on the community. And, and she said, we should do something about that. And Jorge came to me and said, we should do something about that. Take from there. Jorge. You know, uh, actually, you know, Ross, it, it metamorphosed into, uh, uh, or morphed is probably the better way to say, it, into what it is currently today. Because uh, prior to my mom passing away, you know, a couple of my close friends, uh, uh, within the Dodger organization involved in marketing. And we, we had talked for uh, the last couple of years about uh, looking at my dad's career and what you have spent this time discussing in great detail, I may add. A very impressive, uh, uh, an illustrious career that established a legacy. And how do we keep that legacy going? How do we, how do we continue to promote that message that in this great country, the United States, you can still come and if you dream, you dream big because everything is possible. And then when my mom passed away, I was taken by the thought of her and her generosity, always asking about the, the waiters, the wait staff, the, the, the attendants at the gas station, whoever, the gardeners. Whoever. She was always making sure that they got their tips, their Christmas bonuses. She wanted, she just got such joy out of that. And so yeah. we decided that in order to continue my my parents' legacy, we would establish this foundation. And of course, the COVID uh, virus struck us shortly thereafter. We were able to have one inaugural event uh, two years ago, a golf tournament. And then we've had to kind of uh, do our best to just hang in there and survive right now with this situation because you can't really do a lot of fundraising. But in the meantime, we wanted to stay active. So I'm happy that uh, with our great sponsors, Los Defensores, we partnered up with the LA Regional Food Bank. And this year we're able to provide 268,000 meals to people who have been impacted, loss of work or whatever. Then mm. in December, we were able to give out our first round of scholarships to young deserving students enrolled in college who are trying to finish, students who are pursuing law or political science or sociology, schools from ranging from UCLA, to uh, Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Dominguez, uh, a number of schools. So we gave out 13 scholarships. Not, not bad, but we were able to give out between two and $5,000 each. And uh, we want to just 
get the you know traction and and build upon that. So that's basically what we're uh, we're focusing on now. Beautiful. I I was reading about the foundation last night, and it says you are committed to serving and supporting charitable, educational, and athletic programs in the Los Angeles area, as well as for those in need internationally. And the foundation is helping Latino students Mm -hmm. further their education in journalism and law. And then, of course, the note about the COVID-19 pandemic, you partnered with the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank to Mm -hmm. offer 268,000 meals. That is an amazing number. Well, fortunately, we're not alone in that category. There are others who have also stepped up and we just felt the the importance of of trying to do our share. You know, my mom used to say, we're not going to come up with the answers for all the world's problems, but at least we can do our part, no matter how small or how big it is. Also, one thing, Ross, it's not only for Latino students. It's it's open to everybody. Anybody. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, one final question, Jaime. You have a lifetime contract with the Dodgers. How much longer do you want to broadcast Dodger games? It's it's very tough for me to say right now. But uh, if I keep feeling as well as I'm feeling right now, I will keep doing the games because I love what I do. And if the Dodgers... uh, uh, wanted to me to continue, I'll be doing that. But I think I will be doing at least two more years, at least. And hasn't it been wonderful that after a 32-year drought, the Dodgers won a world championship, I mean, for you? <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it is great. It is great. There is nothing like, a, like a winning a World Series. Another ring. Yes. Uh, I'm going you, to miss you in it, the book. Is this six, champ- six championships for you? Six, six World Series championships. Six, yeah, six. Yeah, I six, miss. You have six yeah. rings. Yeah, uh, six rings. Yeah, six rings. Well, I didn't get a ring in 1959. Yeah. There you are. There, there you, you go. go. You 1988. Yeah. Yes. Well, Tommy, I'm so grateful that you gave us your time, and Jorge, thanks for for joining yeah. us. Uh, Jaime, you are an inspiration to so many people. Stay well, my friend. Ross, thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. You know that I love you. I love Lynn. And you you were one of the examples that I have tried to follow because you, you since the days of uh, Channel 4 there and then continuing with the Dodgers, you were always, always there and showing great responsibility, uh, great respect to everybody. And, uh, and it was so easy to, to get along with you. I miss you, uh, and uh, and I I I ask everything's fine. And Ross, I miss my days when I was up in the helicopter doing the uh, traffic with you in the late afternoons at That's five right. o'clock. You were doing Dodger Talk and the pregame show. That's right, and you were a you traffic I- reporter for KABC. Was it twenty five years? Yeah, I just I just finished up thirty five years in broadcasting, so I'm I'm done. I'm retired. I'm just going to be a fan now. <laughs> As you told me the other day, it's going to be fun to go with your family to the games and, yeah. and not have to be doing some work, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I look forward to sitting in the stands with my wife and my sons. That's wonderful. Gentlemen, yep. thank you again. Bless you both. Thank you, Ross, very much. I have enjoyed very much this talk. <laughs>